Back in 1973, I did a silly thing. I got hooked into photographing railroad tramps in the Los Angeles freight yards. I got hooked because I met one of them one day. And he told me he just came in on a freight train into the LA freight yards. And then my mind started working and I thought I realized that Los Angeles is the end of the line of all the railroads that come from the East Coast. And so somebody back East who gets down and out and has a fight with his wife or gets fired from the job or is an extreme alcoholic or is bothered by the war, the war, the woman and the bottle, something drives them to the road and maybe on a late Saturday night and it's dark and they hear the scream of the whistle of a freight train heading out and it calls to them. And they get on that train and they end up in Los Angeles. And I got hooked. I got hooked by the dusty clothes and the sad faces and the bad stories they told me. And I went down there to photograph them. I was a professional photographer at the time doing mostly social documentary essays for corporations, but this was something for myself. And I went down there almost every day for 10 years. I even moved my business. I was restoring antique cars and I moved my business down there to a body shop near the freight yards. And on my lunch hour, I would get down there and shoot pictures of the tramps that were coming in on the trains. Some days I wouldn't see any and some days I'd see several. And I learned how to get close you have to get close for this kind of work. You got to show the stubble on their face and the pain in their eyes. And I mostly used a 28 millimeter lens on an old Nikon F body or a 50 millimeter lens. I used the 28 because I wanted to show the background. I had to get close to these guys. You don't talk to a guy from 10 feet away. You talk to a guy like you would the neighbor. But I needed a wide angle to show the trains and the tracks in the background. Normally I shoot in the street with a 50 millimeter lens, but I used a tool for the 28 for this particular instance. And the more I went down there, the more it dragged me back down there. The terrible stories I heard about these men and what happened to their lives and how they were forced to that hard, hard road of riding freight trains west where they might feel the warmth of the California sun and sleep on the beach and maybe pick oranges from the trees to live on. But too many came for that sunshine and the warmth from the bad snows back in Detroit or New York. Too many came and it was a bad jungle. And there were bad tramps waiting in the bushes for the unwary that, are, that came in the freight trains and got off and not knowing where they are and they got jumped and killed and their satchels taken. And the little money they had for wine was stolen from them. But I was there and I suffered through all this and I cried with them. I had a secret weapon. I had a wonderful white dog that went everywhere with me. He was a, a, a classic act. And I would go down there to the freight train yards with the dog. And normally if I didn't have the dog, a tramp would see me coming with my cameras and they would disappear because that's how they survived. They had to get away from society. They had to stay away from the railroad police to survive. But when they saw me coming with a white dog, and the white dog was usually 100 feet ahead of me, and by the time I got up close to the tramp, the tramp was kneeling down petting my white dog because the white dog was just a very docile, loving animal. It would never bark. It would never harm anybody. And they, it was like a magnet to these people. And the people never saw beauty on the road, but they saw the beauty in the dog. And when I walked up to them, they were kneeling and petting the dog. And I was in like Flynn because of the dog. And I made believe that I was more interested in the trains. I wanted to appear like a working guy, which I was, on my day off or on my lunch hour, come down there to photograph the trains. I didn't want to put any pressure on them. I still do that in my street work when I'm photographing people at close range in the streets. I always try to make believe I'm interested in something other than what I'm photographed to take the pressure off them. The camera causes pressure. Nobody likes to have pressure put on them with a camera. They don't know if they look right. They don't know why the photographer is taking the picture. Big question. Big anxiety. I had to relieve all that with these men. The tramps, they don't want cameras. They don't want pictures. They want to disappear. But I learned so much about getting close and about surviving. It was a very dangerous place down there. A lot of murders. For many, many years, they've been going through those yards and getting knocked off and 
run over by trains and the yard bulls. And I would get hassled sometimes by the yard bulls. But I had a way of working and I, I kind of relaxed into it and I was able to get along with these people. I didn't dress up as a body man I, I, and fender man and car painter and mechanic. I always had dirty clothes on. I was down there in my lunch hour. I kind of got along with these guys, especially with the dog. And it made me a better photographer. It made me learn tricks of survival and of getting close and of working with the cameras without causing too much attention to the cameras and bringing too much attention to them. And I couldn't get away from it. It was too powerful of an essay. And the more I got into it, the more I realized that maybe the way I photographed them and maybe the way people looked at my pictures might provide a more compassionate understanding for these bad men who are, who are usually thought of as bad men, but they're not. I found them to be brothers and uncles and nephews and fathers and grandfathers that have had a bad time in life. Like I said, the war, the woman in the bottle pushed them over the edge and they had to get away. And they got on that freight train and they tried to go anywhere but where they were. And I was there every day. I went down there and I started to photograph them. I couldn't stop. It was a wonderful photographic essay in my mind of what I wanted to do. And it was very difficult for me because I cried a lot. They cried a lot. Most of them were wine alcoholics. They tried to get away from it in the bottle. But they made friends with me. I was something from the outside with a smile that came in and made them feel good and talked to them as a man, not as a tramp, not as a bum. You know, there's a difference. Hobos don't work. Tramps work and bums can't. That was what they told me. The bum is the wine alcoholic that lays around on the street and are helpless and they really can't work. And a hobo, you don't see riding freight trains. You see them walking by the side of the road with a bindle on their back and a funny hat. But the tramps ride freight trains, and the tramps are proud that they can work. I remember my friend uh, Percy. He was going to ride the freight trains back to uh, North Carolina to do some picking back there in the season, picking fruit or whatever it was. And he went through Texas on a weekend, and he came by on the railroad tracks. There was a big building on the side of the tracks that was being demolished, but there was no one working because it was a weekend. And he knew what to do by being a very smart, intelligent tramp. And he went and he took the little money that he had and he went to the hardware store and he bought a hacksaw and a hammer. And during that weekend, he went into that big abandoned building and he cut out the copper pipe. And in that whole weekend, he got the copper pipe and he sold it for $1,500 and made his way back to North Carolina. And he lived under a bridge in Los Angeles for 37 years and he was my friend. And those are some of the things that I got out of that project. Many friends that I would see over and over again, they'd come back through L.A. Sometimes I wouldn't recognize them, they had aged so much, but they remembered me, they called me the picture man. And so that's what I did, I, I couldn't get away, I couldn't get away, because I knew that the photographs were very important for me to make. It was real. It was dangerous, but it was real, and I saw many terrible things. Some of the pictures I can look at, I can remember the conversations I had with these people and what I did and what they did and where they were coming from and what had happened to them in their lives. This is Elmer. He was the first one. He told me he had a camera once. He said, I had a camera once. It was one of them Kodaks. And the reason I remember it because I won it in a pool game. And the guy didn't even have to have the money to pay for the pool game. I had to pay for the pool game, the table fee. But I got that Kodak camera, but I don't think Elmer ever made any pictures of it. And by the time I saw Elmer, he was a tragic wine alcoholic. And he got very dangerous because in the afternoon after he'd have his wine, he'd get belligerent. Even with me, he'd start to get belligerent. And then one day he told me he had a, a good deal he was working on. And later he told me about it. And he, he said, way out in East L.A., there's a place... The, uh, the Light and Power Company had a yard where they stored their stuff and there was a whole bunch of wire, copper wire there, and he was going to go out and get it. And one day he did, and he pushed a shopping cart about 10 miles out into East L.A., all the way on foot through the traffic and everything. And he got that wire. He cut a hole in the fence somehow, and he got that wire. He got about 100 pounds of this wire, and he put it in the shopping cart and dressed like he was, you know, 
he was lucky he didn't get murdered on the way back because he had to push it 10 miles through the streets of East LA. And he finally got it back to the New York Junk Company, which is down by the yards, and he sold it all for 50 bucks. And I think the 50 bucks cost him his life. I think someone rolled him because I didn't see him after that. I think someone rolled him and killed him when he got belligerent and he showed off that money. And he was so tragic. He has this, this army field jacket on with the epaulets flapping in the breeze. How many people would walk around with the epaulets on their jacket flapping in the breeze? It was like a semaphore of permanent distress, like Hemingway would write about it. And they were all there. And these guys, you know, I didn't ask many questions. I didn't want to know their names, and they didn't want to tell me their names. And if they did, it was not their real name. But I was talking with these guys, and they seemed to be reasonable. I remember this from 40 years ago. I remember what they said to me. So I said, you guys are waiting out for a train, huh? And I said, yeah. I said, well, where are you headed? And they said, we don't care. And I never forgot that. I never could, I, I could never get my mind around that, how someone could just go to a bus station and say, give me a ticket. And the guy would say, where do you want to go? I don't care. Or I'm waiting for the train. Where do you want to go? I don't care. That they could just get on a train and go somewhere out of L.A., away. And I waited, and I worked with a 28 millimeter lens. Most of the stuff was done with a 28 millimeter lens because I had to get close and show the background, as I said before. And here it is. I know I needed three or four things to tell the story. The gesture, the gesture, the despondent look, the old hat, sitting on the rail. The only guy I ever saw drinking soda pop <laughs> in all the years that I went there. And he was, these were nice guys. They were traveling together, beautiful men. And I spent 10, 15 minutes with them and learned so much about life from them. Jim, about 1975, he's not a real tramp. He's a tramp because he wants to be a tramp. He loves the road. He's a plasterer from Texas. That's the guy that plasters houses. And back in those days, they were making 150 bucks a day because it's such rugged work. And you have to know how to mix that plaster so it sticks on the wall. And it's easy for the men to apply it. He was the mixer. And he told me he'd get $1,500 in his pocket and he'd quit his job and hit the road. He'd been on the road for more than six months now and he had no money. And my friend Roger Carter and I were down there. That walk, he, my friend Roger came down there with me to, to hang out with me as I photographed these guys. And it was the only time I had a drink with these guys in all those years. And we went and bought a six pack and brought it back and Jim helped us drink the six pack and there he is waiting for a train. And he was cool, he knew all about the trains and he was very proud of what he was. And he told me, he says, I'm waiting for the gray ghost. The gray ghost was a big, uh, express, what they call an express freight train. It had eight engines on it or units they called it eight engines and it would go 60, 70 miles an hour. And they said, a passenger, crying, a passenger train will pull over to the siding to let the, the express freight train go through. And he says, I'll ride that gray ghost and in 24 hours I'll be setting in Houston. I'll never forget that, what he said. Two days out of Canada, heading for Mexico, young men, hippies back in the 70s, heading for Mexico, where are they now? Wonderful guys. The shack where some of them would stay in the freight yard. See, they'd, they'd sneak around. They'd stay in the, maybe stay the night in the shack. And they're heading for Mexico. Never saw them again. There she is. Another shot of her. 1975. 15 years old. Running away from home. A broken home, she said. And I knew from experience that the train would have a caboose on the back. But I couldn't see the train coming because of this bridge. It was, you know, I was blinded by this bridge. So I set up the shot the way I wanted it, not moving anything, of course, but moving myself in relationship to what was before me. I know I needed her bindle and her bag of belongings. And I waited because I knew that there was always a man looking out of the door, out of the window on the caboose. Usually the man in the caboose was running the train. Anyway, the caboose finally came. There was the man. Boom! I made the image. And later when I made the print, I saw where it said, Jesus saves on the side of the car. Never saw it when I made the print, when I made the photograph, because there wasn't much time. It was going by pretty quick. But there she is, 15 years old. The most beautiful thing I saw in 10 years in those freight yards. Beautiful blonde hair. 
wonderful woman. She's in her late 50s now. I hope she survived. I hope she sees me holding this picture now in this video. And I hope she gets back to me because I've thought of her so much. I wondered about her. See, that's what's so bad about being a photographer. You carry the pictures with you. The pictures never go away. They're always there. There's another picture of Jim. Don Savage. The only time I got in the car. You see, I got in the gondola car. This is a gondola car. He's riding on pig iron, like the song. He just got out of prison, did 13 years for double murder. Don Savage. I can say his name now because it was 35 years ago. And I got in the car with him. He told me he was a convicted murderer and I still got in the car. What a nut I was, huh? But I got the shot. I got lots of shots of Don in there. And Jim. And Jim, another print. Oh, and this, the brother-in-laws. He had two families, one in Texas, one in Mexico, and they didn't know about each other. He had once been a Cadillac dealer. This is Christmas Day, 1974. You talk about me dedicated. I left my family Christmas morning to go down there to the freight yards and left my wife and child at home. But they understood, my wife understood that I had to go there. And this is my friend that I went there with. His family, his wife had left him the night before and took the kids. Here's his brother-in-law. These two men spent Christmas Eve in the front end of a parked garbage truck with no doors in a driving rainstorm in Los Angeles, looking at pictures of their children that are seven years old. The pictures are seven years old because they've been on the road for seven years. Seven years on the road, and they got no money, and the wine bottle is empty. They chugged that all night, Christmas Eve. Can you imagine? Christmas Eve in the front end of a garbage truck with no doors, and on the side of the garbage truck was a big crown, Crown Disposal Company, with two knights of the line sitting in the front seat. And I had to be there on Christmas Day, and I had to share their tears and their story. And there's my wonderful dog, Casper, that made it possible. Always watching, always there, but always at a little bit of a distance and never harmed anybody. This is what I saw. Never talked to this man. He never looked my way, never wanted to, to really say anything to me. And years later, I found out that he is probably a very famous tramp called Guitar Whitey. And he was an old man when I saw him in Los Angeles standing in that freight car, nowhere to go. Nowhere to go but down. That's what I saw. That's what I did. Now, this is a good one. I'm not saying it's a good photograph. I'm saying it was a good story. This man is mentally retarded, and, uh, but not as a tramp. You see, he knew all about being a tramp. He's got a good bindle tied up there. He's got a good friend that he's with. He knows all about the trains. So in that respect, he's not retarded at all. He's better than I am at knowing how to survive and knowing about the trains and knowing how to deal with this kind of a life. So here's a mentally retarded man that found a wonderful place for himself. And it makes him proud of himself that he can hold down one of these fast freights and not get busted by the yard bulls or rolled over by another tramp looking for a soft, easy prey. You know, here he is with his bindle. He's having a cigarette. He's taking a break. And I knew him and I met him and I talked with him and I felt with him. And I saw him and I photographed him. And I saved the photography, the photograph for you and to share it with you. That's what I want to do with these photographs to provide a more compassionate understanding. This guy... I found out three years later, murdered his brother-in-law. He had just, when I took this picture, he had just walked from South Central L.A., walked 10 miles to the, to the yards. He had just said goodbye to his mother, and he was headed for Texas, where he said he had a job in a dry cleaning uh, plant. So years later, I found out from another tramp that the dry cleaning uh, place was owned by his brother-in-law. And he killed his brother-in-law. He murdered his brother-in-law because of a love triangle with his brother-in-law's wife. He's got his bindle. And it was a hip shot, and I think I made a mistake. It was a hip shot with a 28, and I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done the hip shot. But I was probably afraid of him a little bit, and I wanted to sneak a shot. I cut off the top of his head. But I like it even better because it draws more attention to his eyes. So sometimes a good mistake will work for you. There's Don Savage again sitting on the, on the pig iron. 
Oh, this is Joe. He wasn't a tramp. He had been forced out of a mental institution by Ronald Reagan when Reagan was governor of California. He had been affected by the Korean War. And he was a wonderful man, a very intelligent, nice man. And he didn't hang around with the other tramps. He was on the other side of the LA River where he stayed by himself and made little fires and he cooked rice that he'd got out of the dumpsters in Chinatown. And he shared it with me. He'd make rice pudding for me. He would go around to the coffee shops and get those non-dairy creamer containers that always had a little bit left in them. And he'd pour them into, into a pot he put a top on it and he'd steam the rice in there with the non-dairy creamers and made an excellent rice pudding. And he was a wonderful guy, Joe. And then in one year, one day he disappeared. He was gone. And, and right up here, everything was missing. All his goods were missing. But right on this, uh, this electrical tower on the cement here, uh, there were two books. And I'm sure he left them for me. They were library books from San Diego. And one was How to Make Money with Your Camera, and the other was Anthropology, the Study of Man. And I didn't take the books because you don't touch. You're a documentary photographer. You don't touch. I knew they were for me, but I wasn't sure, and I left them. And it's always bothered me ever since. But in a way, I was glad because I was a truly a documentary photographer, and I didn't touch. These are other pictures and not associated with this. Friends for five seconds. I couldn't believe it. There was a big catwalk that went over the yards. There was hundreds of tracks. Well, not hundreds, but say 50 different tracks in the yards. And as I'm walking over the catwalk, I look down and here's a freight train moving out. And here's this guy sitting in crap. The bottom of a gondola car, all grease and crap. And he's smiling and he waved at me. We were friends for five seconds and he disappeared under the catwalk and was gone. What a deal. What a, and I got the shot. And I got enough of the background and foregrounder to, sh to give some of a story. That was always on my mind, you see. The documentary photographer has a big problem. They're there, they see what's all going on, but they have to back up a little bit in their mind and they have to know enough to show more to the viewer of the photograph, because the viewer of the photograph wasn't there with me. They didn't see all the yards and hear all the train whistles and the rumble of the, of the diesels. So I had to give enough information in my photograph that might make it easier for them to understand the situation. And that's what this is. Never knew his name. Maybe he'll see this image now and remember that gondola car and he'll give me a wave again. That's what I dream of. That's what I would love to have. Somebody get back to me. These are some of the young boys that would greet me every day when I parked my car and they'd come up to greet me and now they're playing on the bridge and this guy's got a pigeon they captured. Just wonderful, but I, I, you know, I was there, I saw it, I loved it. I was their friend. There was a real tramp, you know, this guy. Back of uh, Hughes Market, way up north in the yards. And he's sitting, you can't see it here and I, I really shouldn't explain photographs where you can't see things. But he's sitting on an electrical control box that he broke open with a big rock. And he knew enough to get a, a, a piece of old metal that was lying by the tracks and pry out all these copper uh, electrical parts that were in there. And he showed me, he had a little pile of them in front of him. They're somewhere around here, you can't see them. And uh, he said, I've got enough here to get a bottle of wine and a hamburger. Three or four dollars worth of copper that he pulls out of there. He's got a real bindle here. They call them bindle stiffs in the old days, but this is a bindle. This is their belongings rolled up with a rope and they'd sling this around their shoulder. He was an old time tramp. These guys were going together. They're too old. Look how old they are. He's got a bindle. And I got close, another with 28 millimeter lens. Here's the bridge in the background that these kids are on, see? There it is there. This is where I hung around for 10 years. And here's Casper the Wonder Dog. And this is Shorty, a wonderful guy. He had a, a withered arm, uh, an arm that had never developed. It was a stumpy arm. As a matter of fact, they called him Stumpy Shorty. And he didn't mind. He was just a wonderful man. And I knew him for, for 10 years. And uh, he was from a family of, of, that had 10 children in uh, Georgia. 
and uh, oh no, Texas. And uh, he had to hit the road because he couldn't help pick cotton because he only had the one arm. And he always carried a gun. I never knew that. And he died out past Palm Springs and they found a gun on him. He would go out to Indio, which is past Palm Springs. That's where he'd go on holiday. He'd ride the train out there. Hottest place in the world. He'd go out there and love it. And he died out there. And there's Casper the Wonder Dog that got me close to these guys. And this is old man Pee Wee. And he's in his 90s. He started riding freight trains before the First World War, and that knocked me out. A black man that survived that long on that terrible hard road when the railroad workers, the yard police in the 30s would come in and just bop them on the head when they were sleeping just to exterminate them. And he survived from before World War I. And he was so cool. I can even do his voice. I remember all the things he said. He was the best beggar that uh, he ever lived you know he would con you out of money and I never gave him any money I, I you know I would do other things for them I'd give them pictures but I made it a point I didn't want to pay for any of this stuff but he loved the dog he loved Casper and he told me one day he pulled out a burlap bag with a big meaty bone he gave it to Casper and I, it just he did that just to aggravate me because I had never given him anything and he said as a joke he said you come down here with $1,500 worth of camera equipment, and I ain't got shit. Old man Pee Wee, a wonderful guy, and I knew him. I was my fr he was my friend. There's the guy that he pulled a knife on another guy. I'm glad he didn't pull one on me. And of course, there's Elmer again. There's Jim waiting to go back to, I got a few pictures of Jim. We spent maybe 15 or 20 minutes with him. A little despondent here, there's the freight train. You see, I always had to get the, the train. I up close to him. You're up close to a guy, you can't use the 50 millimeter lens, you're only going to get their face. I wanted to show, set the scene for the average person that looks at my photograph. You can see the train pulling out. Obviously that's not his train, that's not the Grey Ghost, but he knows his trains and he's waiting there. But this is what I had to do as a documentary photographer. Show enough of the scene that you know what's happening. Now it's funny, I showed this to Dino today and I said, there's two guys there. And he says, no, there's only one. And you're right, you can't really see the second guy's there, but that's it's the dregs of my memory. I was there and I'm putting more into it than is in the, uh, evident in the picture. I knew there were two guys and I keep saying it, but you can't see them. So it was my mistake. Maybe I should have gotten up a little more to get the second guy, but I wanted to get down low enough to show how low they were in life. And he still got a good pair of shoes. And a guy with a suitcase, you didn't see many guys with suitcases. Some of the guys would try to dress up to look like railroad men with suitcases so they wouldn't get busted. Maybe that's what they're doing, because they're not badly dressed, you see. But they must be so tired. It's a hard road. You ride in this, they don't have any springs really on these things, it just bangs you to death. And if you don't have water, you're going to die. If that thing pulls off into the desert and sits idle for a couple of days, you're going to die of thirst. So they all carry water with them, except the inexperienced ones don't, and they die. But here they're so tired, they're sleeping on the gravel next to the... And they're get, they're, they could get busted. The, the yard bulls could come down. There's that bridge again. The yard bulls, the yard police could come down and bust them for that. They're not supposed to be there. They're trespassing. Here's Shorty with his... With his iron, this is his short iron sack. In other words, short iron is the stuff that falls off the freight cars and it's lying on the road. And every, every day he'd walk down and he'd find pieces of metal and he'd put it in his sack and he'd go and he'd sell it at the New York Junk Company. He was such a nice man. He'd say to me, Oh boy, you come down here today snapping pictures, having a good time. It was just so cool. We were dear, dear friends for a long time. We had a party down there one time. You know, a lot. That we, we had a party that my friends and my family and all the tramps met under this bridge, this bridge here over on this side. And the tramps said, we'll bring the ribs to eat and you guys bring the booze. And we did. And we all met under there and we had a party. It was wonderful. They, had, they cleaned it out and put a big tarp over all the trash and swept it clean. And there was two anthropologists from South America. Many people like that would come and work with me down there because they wanted to see how, how I was able to get so close and how I was able to survive. My brother-in-law was an anthropologist. He went down there to study with me. And these two women from South America came up to watch me to come down there. And that's what I do in my workshops now. A lot of people come from all over the world to work with me to see how I'm able to, in the street or in a social documentary project, 
how I'm able to instantly get close to people without offending them or without putting them off or without scaring them with the camera. And I'm able to get in there and smile and take pictures and know their whole life story in five minutes. And it's worth it. That My workshops are worth it just for that. Just to learn how to survive in that dangerous situation in the streets or a dangerous situation like those freight yards. I survived those years. I was never touched. No one ever laid a hand on me. And I've learned that that's what I do in the street and that's what I do in my workshops. I help you, the photographer, to learn how to survive and to smile and to get these close-up images of someone's soul. Basically, that's what it is, their soul. I made a lot of prints of Jim sitting on there. It's a very difficult print to make. And my son will tell you, I sprint, I print for the stubble on his face. That's the most important thing I print for. If I don't get the stubble on his chin, then it's not a good print. I have to hold his head back and not give it so much light. And then I have to give more light over here and more light over here. And this was white sand, so I had to burn that down with more light without burning his hand down too much. Very difficult print to make. I get a lot of wasted paper doing that, you know. Now here's my friend Bobby Cato. He was the toughest guy down there. He had one leg. Here's his crutch. And he's showing off to me uh, fighting with Curly. This is, this is Curly. He died of cancer and they took him away and he waved. He waved to us as they took him away in the ambulance and we never saw him again. He had stomach cancer. And there he is fighting. But he was the toughest guy. He was like Long John Silver in the movie Treasure Island. He'd get in a fight and he'd take off that crutch and he'd throw it at you, and, uh, at your legs, and that would knock you down and then he'd hop up on one leg and jump on you. But we were best friends and he, would, he didn't drink that much. And he was, he was logical all the time and clear-headed, and we had wonderful conversations. This man is dying of cancer when I made these photographs. He had gotten injured on the freight train or in a fight. Later, he pulled a knife on another guy. Not on me, but I heard a story about him. And uh, his ear was all cancerous, and, and it was all blood and dribbling down the side of his face. And I got many pictures of him here on one day that I, that I was with him, and he was cooking tortillas and of course he's got the wine bottle back here and he's from Texas a lot of those guys were from Texas and there's a close-up of Casper the Wonder Dog at my body shop where I restored antique cars that's a one-off Bentley they only made six models of that there's a 32 Ford two-door two sedan there's a 38 uh, Cadillac I worked down there and I moved my business down close to the freight yard so I could be closer to the tramps but there's Casper the Wonder Dog Someone gave me that dog when I came back from Europe, when I first got into photography. And he was with me for 10 years. There's Bobby Cato. Look at that, showing how cool he is. My friend, a great painter that lives down the street, Pablo Campos, said, look, his, his foot is higher than his head. He was a wonderful man. He's from New Orleans. Bobby Cato. Several stories about how he lost his leg. <laughs> Young man, his early 20s going from Virginia to Seattle, Washington to see his girlfriend. I talked with him for five or ten minutes, and he was gone again. There's his bindle. He's got a stick for protection. A nice man. I always wonder about him. Where did he go and what happened? Here goes a, a very rare scene of a, a fast passenger train going by and a nice conductor waving at me out. That, that made it worthwhile, things like that. Another picture of Jim. You know, I did several pictures of Jim and try to get whatever you can. There's another picture, another one, Don Savage. We already saw one of these, 13 years for murder, and I got in a car with him like a dope, you know? But I had to for some reason. I never got in another car. He was cool. You back up. You back up to get more information, but then you take a risk because you're not close enough to the subject. But I still think you can see the subject, and he's despondent. Here's his bindle. Here's George. He lived, you know, right there with, with his ten brothers and sisters. And he would come and visit me every day when I parked my car in the same place as the 40 Pontiac I had at the time. And I'd park it in the same place and he'd come up to say hello in the morning. Now this, this is crazy. This is... Uh, where are the other pictures? Of, uh, Might be in there. Oh yeah. Uh, there's a, the New York Junk Company is right down there. 
right here. See here, they're, they're, here's the jungle. This is an open lot by the side of the tracks. And here they are looking at my photographs. I'd always bring photographs down there and I'd give them photographs. And they thought it was the greatest thing in the world to have a photograph of themselves in this condition. And here they are looking at my prints. There's Shorty. There's Bobby Kay, the one-legged guy, and his girlfriend, Gloria. And there's <laughs> Kelly. And we'll get to him in a little bit. But Kelly. But anyway, I look over and the New York Junk Company... And I see this old Studebaker come in there, wherever it is. I got these all mixed up now, do you know? Anyway, this old guy comes in in an old beat up car. No. And I get talking to him and he says, well, you were restoring cars, are you? His name was Oliver. And I said, yeah, and I'm helping him unload the junk out of his car. See here, there's New York junk company, he brings in all this trash that he's, he's gone through the streets of L.A. He's got a little trailer on the back of an old Studebaker. And he picks up junk and he takes it down there and sells it. And, and when I told him, I said, well, I'm, I'm a body man. I restore cars. I'm down here photographing the trams. He said, well, you'll have to come and see my old Mercedes. And I didn't believe him. I thought oh, he's exaggerating or he had an old beat up, you know, modern car. Make a long story short. I get him in my car and I take him to the garage. He says, go over to this garage in Glendale that he owns. So I found out he must be a millionaire because he owns several properties in Glendale. And he opens the door and here's this car. And it's one of the most valuable cars in existence. You know, I, I'm kind of an expert on classic cars, antique cars. This is a 1925 Mercedes-Benz supercharged with 3,000 miles on it. All aluminum hand-formed body by one of the best bodybuilders in this country, Murphy Body in Pasadena, right next door to me here. In the old days, you'd buy a car like this, you'd just get the front end, you wouldn't get the body, and then you'd take it to one of your bodybuilders, your favorite body shops, and they would build the body. So a rich man in this country bought this car in Germany, it came back on the boat from Germany, they took it to Pasadena, Murphy Body made this all aluminum body, it was never painted, it was always polished, polished aluminum. Of course, it's very degraded now because it was so old, but he saved it. He bought it for $150 in 1938 at an estate sale at the time when Americans were getting rid of German cars because of the onset of World War II, and he saved it. And it's one of the most valuable cars in existence to this day. It's the only one ever built, a one-off car. And many uh, of the big classic car collectors in this area were always after him, trying to get him to sell it. And so he got tired of them. He, he, he wanted to save it. It was his car. It was a big, valuable thing that he had. And he hid it in this garage. And I was the first one to see it in many, many years. He trusted me. There he is unloading his car. And there's more pictures of him. Here he is before he, we even pulled the car out of the garage. There he is. And here's the car. I was way back in the garage to get this. And I'm crapping in my pants. I was so nervous that he was going to turn on me and, and kick me out of there before I could get pictures of the car. And he wanted me to restore it. And I, I had to tell him that it was too far gone. It would be too expensive for him to restore. And so, you know, he finally died and, and a very rich man in Connecticut, my home state, got the car. And now the car is back in Connecticut. Crazy, huh? There's another old man. Just got some pants from the Goodwill store. He's putting them on in the morning. There's that bridge in the background. There's a lot of this happened right in this area. And I knew these guys, and I talked to them, and I helped them sometimes. And I gave them some strength by, by, by talking to them civilly and not trying to hit them on the head or arrest them or steal their money. I was friendly, and that's what got me close, and the dog. Now, these are two guys that work for the railroad. They were not nice at all. You know, look at this guy. <laughs> I said, gee, I was just talking to some tramps up the line. And this guy says, those assholes. Oh, gee. And I left just that quick. Here's, here's Bobby Kay and Gloria, and he's all pissed off. He says, yeah, we're going to Salt Lake. They're going to hop a freight train and go to Salt Lake City. I said, why are you going up there? He says, because the people are so easy up there to get money out of. He says, you could do real good begging up there in Salt Lake City. She's 27 years old. Shorty cooking biscuits under the North Spring Street Bridge. That's where we had the party. <laughs> He's got this shopping cart turned upside down for a grill, and he makes wonderful biscuits. There's Mr. Brown in the background, but that's Shorty. He's a wonderful guy. You can't see his other arm, you know, the bad arm. 
I was friends with these guys. They were wonderful guys. And there's Elmer, the first one, that the terrible wine alcoholic. This is this is it, man. This is as low as you go, drinking two ke toke out of a out of a sixty cent bottle, you know. And uh, there's the epaulets on his jacket flapping in the breeze, and the the sun going down in L.A. and the tracks and the bad bad life. And I had to suffer through all that, you know, and it was pretty miserable a lot of times. Now, these two guys were really funny. This guy was a priest, and he kept calling them father. But you see, they dressed up as railroad men. They even had the hats and the suitcases so they wouldn't get busted. And he was real Irish, talked with an Irish accent, and he called him father, and he was a priest. And it was kind of cool. Here they are taking the bottle out of the luggage, you know. He got that bottle, that bad boy. They call it a Madonna. This is a place you didn't want to get caught in because of the wall. This is the L.A. River. And uh, this big wall here, and then another wall here. You didn't want to get caught here because there's no way to run. You could only go this way. You couldn't get over. So if somebody was in there after you, you'd have a hard time. I stayed out of there. I stayed up on here and stayed away from there. It was a pretty dangerous spot. But this person was unaware of that, you know. This is old man Pee Wee and bumming cigarettes from Big Man. Now, Big Man was a prize fighter. And he snapped one day and left home. He had a home and car and wife and kids and everything. Boom, and he snapped. His wife had an affair, uh, and he snapped and, and came down there. And, and everybody liked Big Man, but he didn't talk to anybody because uh, you couldn't understand him. He'd say everything two or three times. What are you doing? What are you coming down here? What are you doing? Why did you come down here? What are you doing? What are you doing? It took me three years to talk to him where he would talk back to me and another three years to understand what he was saying. <laughs> he had sparred with Muhammad Ali at one time in his career. His name was Haley Whitesides. Anybody know, everybody ever hear of Haley Whitesides? And he was a big, tough guy. And he was really a nice person to me. And he was playing with my son with little trucks in the sand when my son was two years old. I'd take him down there once in a while to meet the tramps. And this is Mr. Newman. This is the second time I saw him. The first time I saw Mr. Newman, he was old. And he, he said, my son used to travel with me, but he doesn't anymore. And he said, I wrote a book once, and the name of the book was Tramp, Tramp, Tramp. And this is when I saw him like six months or a year later. I can't tell. And he had aged so much when he was coming back the other way that I didn't recognize him. Until just recently, I realized that that's Mr. Newman, the second time I photographed him. Another guy waiting out. That's what they called it when they were waiting for a freight train. They didn't say, I'm going to hop a freight train. Very few of them ever hopped a freight train. They'd get on the train when it was in the yards and it wasn't moving because it's too dangerous to, to run and catch a train. But here comes a train coming and he doesn't know where he's going. And he's, he's in rough shape. He didn't have a bindle. He didn't have water. He had nothing. Here, here, I ran into these tramps 25, 30 years later. I met some of them down, way down below. I'm walking in the freight yards. I just went down there one last time to walk around. 30 years, 25 years after I made these images. And this guy calls to me. And here they are. And I brought pictures with me. And they're going through the pictures from 30 years previously. There's another picture of Joe. Of the gesture. You got to get the gesture. And here they are. He had just put his pants on from the goodwill. Too old to be on the line like that. And here's Big Man. See, he's got the fighter's pose and Bobby Kay's horsing around. Somehow, Bobby Kay got a Polaroid camera and he's showing off with it. And look at this graffiti here in here. 1964. <laughs> That's how long it had lasted. There's old man Pee Wee. And I don't know who these guys are. They might have been people from uh, Mexico that had, that, you know, snuck into this country. And they're passing a bottle of wine. Oh, there's Mr. Newman, see? There's Mr. Newman before I took that other picture of him. Where is it? There, look at it. Huh? He's aged a little bit here. And he's the one that wrote the book, Tramp, Tramp, Tramp. And I never found a copy of it or, or heard any more of it about it. These guys are doing something dangerous. They're walking on the, on the right of way. And if the yard bull sees them walking in between the tracks, they'll definitely get busted for that. Bobby Kay and Gloria, there's where she's 27 years old. Both 
she's a wine alcoholic, he's not. He protects her. And they were a good couple. She was lucky to have Bobby Kay in her life. He was a good man. I was with him when he died in a hospital. He disappeared one day. I went down there 10 years after all these pictures were taken and went looking for him. And they said, no, Bobby Kay got taken out of here in an ambulance. And uh, I started looking for him in all the hospitals. I went to so many hospitals. And I finally found him in a small hospital in East L.A. And I went up to the desk and I said, do you have a, a, a Bobby Cato here? She said, no. And I turned around and I started to walk out. She said, but we have an Isaac Cato. And it was him. And uh, they took me up to his room. He had a private room. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know he was a tramp. He was just brought in. And he's lying in the bed, not moving for like two months. And his head is all sunk into the, piddle, in, into the pillow. And I hardly recognized him. He wasn't moving. And he had all these machines plugged into him. He had had a heart attack. And he was on life support. And he was in a coma. And I started jiving to him. You know, I don't know what I was thinking. I said, hey, man, the picture, John, the picture man came down to visit you, Bobby. We, 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 the men back at the campfire were wondering when the hell are you going to come back to the jungle and swill some wine with the boys back there. And his eyelids started to move. And I took no pictures of him when he was lying in the bed. But I saw his eyelids move when I started talking to Jive, talked to him like the old days, and he died the next day. His name was Isaac Cato. He's from New Orleans. He said he got $6,000 when he lost his leg, and it was gone within two months. He took taxi cabs everywhere and threw lavish parties. He spent all that money, and he got $6,000 when $6,000 was worth about $50,000 today. <laughs> the life I had, man, I wouldn't trade it for anything. What I saw down there is another picture of Oliver, the man with the classic car, unloading his trailer. Oh, he said, and I try to help him unload it. Oh, he said, don't do that, for God's sake. He says, you'll get your hands dirty. He was a wonderful guy. He wanted to know all about my family and my children. And he says, you have to come down and see my old Mercedes. Foggy day. Got the bottle. Going nowhere. Running away from life. What can I tell you? It was the most grueling and the most satisfying project photographically that photography has allowed me. And Dorothea Lange was with me in mind and spirit and all the great documentary photographers was with me. I learned so much from Dorothy, you know, to get close, how she would be kind to people and she walked with a severe limp and she would go into a place and, on the side of the road in a pea picker's camp, the migrant workers' camp, and she'd go in there with her camera. And all in those days in the 30s, you know, to have your picture taken was a big thing. They weren't shy or put off by it like they are today. And so all the kids would run up to her, to Dorothy. She'd get out of the car and she'd, she'd go in there. She'd want to make photographs. And she had a wonderful trick on how to get close. And they'd all come up. And so she'd pose, oh, okay, we're going to take pictures. Now you stand over there and we'll get these pictures. And, and she'd take these pose pictures. And after she took the pose pictures, now she could walk around and get any pictures she wanted to without being bothered. And it was wonderful. And that's what she did. And that's what I did. I learned it from her. And here's Joe, the guy that stuck by himself by the, by the electrical tower. And there's Casper. And here I am eating rice pudding with him. See my hair in those days? I was a young man then. Still had the Nikon sitting down here. You know, these old Nikons, wide angle lenses, beat to hell, still work real good. The camera strap pulls me, pulls me down there. I have no control over it. How can you get away from something like this? How can you not photograph something like this? You know, what can you do? You have to do it. You know that they're in trouble. You know they have a miserable life. You know all the stories they, they labored. They, I'd be with them five minutes, I'd know their whole life story, and I never asked them a question. It would just pour out of them. I remember one man telling me he'd, 
he'd beg and, and he'd get some money and he'd have enough wine, but then he'd get some extra money and he'd go and he'd put it in a pay phone booth and he'd call his wife. And when she answered the phone and she said hello, he'd hang up and lose all the money and never say anything to his wife. And she probably knew it was him. And then another guy said, I went all the way back to upstate New York just to watch my kid play in a little league ball game and he never saw me. I hid behind the stand so he couldn't see me. And I just watched him play that one little league ball game. And then he got a freight train and came all the way back to California, never contacted the son. And then another man went back he went all the way back home and he got home. He walked up the street to his house and it was six o'clock in the morning and it was just getting light and there was a strange pickup truck in his driveway and he looked in the kitchen window and it was a strange man having breakfast with his wife and he never approached him. He turned around and rode freight trains all the way back to Los Angeles again and I talked with these guys and I was there and I cried with them.